Are you working in a nonprofit, but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world, but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Priscilla Stefan. She worked in the environmental nonprofit field for a decade and burned out. Although she never thought she wanted to be an entrepreneur, she loved the independence and creativity this path afforded her. She is now an intuitive business strategist and creator of the Soul Fluent Leadership Archetypes that helps soul-driven women and entrepreneurs create sustainable, world-changing businesses that support the greater good. Priscilla, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. That is such a great introduction. And hi to everyone that is listening. <laughs> So I was trying to mash all of your interests together, all of your background together. So I'm glad you liked that. (laughs) (laughs) So can you explain a little more about your nonprofit employee background and just like the pain points that you felt that led you to transitioning out of the world? Uh, Sure. And I will uh, add to that firstly, that I never thought um, my, I've gone through three three huge career changes, many dark nights of the soul. And I never envisioned that I would be in the environmental field had it not been for an elective that I had to take. Well, it was kind of like a mandatory elective at NYU. And it turned out to be environmental studies. And I went, what the hell are people doing to the planet? Somebody's got to do something about it. And then got a graduate degree in international environmental policy. Um, at Columbia. And then I was like, okay, let's go to, and then I chose World Wildlife Fund because it just seemed like the kind of the place that worked well for me. And I did policy work and it was a dream come true. Um, I beat 33 other candidates. I was what, 24 years old. And I was like, oh my God, I get to travel the world and I'm Brazilian by birth. I get to use my language skills. I speak Portuguese and Spanish and some conversational French. And it was amazing. And I was there for five years. I made lifelong friends. I traveled the world and I was feeling like I was on top of, like on top of the world because I was helping to make the world a better place. I was very concerned about the Amazon rainforest and and really passionate about forestry, even though I was working in trade, international trade, which is technical and I didn't love. But I love the fact that I was focusing on Latin America and forestry and really working on the high level government level of working with leaders to uh, create better policies across Latin America in trade and forestry and whatnot. And it was amazing. But as I was going through this, I remember, I think... This was in the early um, 99, I think. And, and I think the administration um, eventually changed, I, you know, the U.S. Admin- political administration. And it was very frustrating to see both with the UP, uh, EPA, but then also internationally. We worked with the U.N. We worked with just other governments, the GATT, the WTO. And I was like, this is... This is a really big uphill battle. And I would see my boss staying up until 2 a.m., writing grants, you know, uh, recrafting languaging that would go into these agreements only to have them either be diluted or completely deleted from the final agreement. And it started to eat at me that there were so many resources and so much effort and that it just seemed like the system, you know, the economic system did not favor the supporting of the environment. And truly environmental support felt like an externality. And I began to feel like I somehow was being pushed at the end of the line. I felt like I was at the front of the line or going to make a difference. And then slowly and slowly and slowly, I was like, wait, this is, we put all this love and effort and I don't feel like it's really, what is this really doing in the world? You know, and I would spend like sometimes six months talking to environmental ministers or vice ministers and environment to come and then to meet with us in DC for dialogues, which would be great. But then only half of them could come or when they came, they had great conversations, but then nothing really happened. And that really tipped at my spirit and began to, 
erode my confidence in a my role that I really was making a difference, um, and it just made it made me wonder, you know, what else is there? So that was the first part that led to kind of like this the whole meaning bit of like kind of the 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 allure of it began to fade. Plus, I noticed that I wasn't great at grant writing. I didn't love the trade aspect of it. Um, and so I was like, I'm not sure that this is necessarily speaking to all my strengths. The gathering of people was great. The, uh, the, the people connection was, I was great at and being on the phone and, and all those things, but not all of it was great. And then there was just the element that, um, I was missing the creative side, which is what you said in the introduction. I didn't think I realized, um, how kind of, um, I don't know. I think you said suppressing. You know, there was something that was being suppressed about myself, you know, in terms of having to be in meetings and um, and write proposals and, and things. It was just, it was like, where is the creativity coming? Where is my creativity in all of this? Where is the sense of beauty and wonder and excitement and um, doing things outside the box? And I didn't even, I don't think I even realized that that was something I needed until it, I was just like, this just feels bland. Boring wasn't quite the word because there's always stuff happening, you know, but it was just felt there was something not extra sparkly and glowy about it. And I love everything that sparkles. And I was like, no, there has to be something else. And being from Brazil and every time I'd go, I'd love to get fashion jewelry and handbags and belts that would be shiny and very artisanal. People would love it. And I thought, well, what about maybe bringing some of this over here to the U.S. and just trying to sell it and and then a business idea formed. What if I created my own brand of, you know, I would source from Brazilian artisanal designers and import them here into my, you know, private label and see where it goes. And so as I was working at, then it was the Inter-American Development Bank, um, I would do this at night. You know, I would start the business from scratch, no idea or interest or thought that I would ever be an entrepreneur, except that my dad was an entrepreneur and has been for 55 years in a completely other field. Um, and I was like, oh, this is exciting. I get to be creative. I get to do, to build. I love, I realize I love building things from scratch and I love having my own stamp and energy on something. And I did that for three years. And it was exciting only to realize that with the changing exchange rates and um, just me doing so much by myself that it wasn't a sustainable model. And I decided to, uh, it was either invest a lot more capital in the hopes of doing something or just move on. And I chose to move on, which was the right move, but it also was utterly soul crushing and devastating because so much of my identity and my sense of self-worth was in this new venture and proving myself. It didn't help that a colleague um, at another organization had started a lingerie business uh, with lingerie designs made in Brazil and she hit it big and uh, created a multi-million dollar business out of it. And, um, and here I was just kind of going to, you know, little craft shows and, and it, you know, Meanwhile, I had visions of going to QVC and going to all these places, which I pitched. You know, I, I went for the dream, but it just never really materialized. And so it was really hard um, on me. So at this point, I had spent a decade in the environmental field. My identity and my graduate degree was wrapped around this environmental work. Uh, I had a business that now had, quote unquote, failed. Um, I was, what, thirty or $50,000 in debt at that point from the business. And I was burned out, worn out, devastated in a black hole at that point. I'd injured my leg. I couldn't walk then for nine months. I was on crutches and physical therapy. And I gained 30 pounds. I mean, it was just a hot mess of a moment of like, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. This fucking sucks. And I was about 32 or 33, single, alone. And I moved to New York City to be live with my mom again. And I felt like a failure and I was lost and I was miserable. So that's the first part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? I'm, I'm really thinking that this is going to resonate with so, so, so many people. I mean, the uphill battle. I mean, we all know that when there's a time crunch and we have to write these grants. And that was one of my failed entrepreneurial ventures too, is um, I had... Um, 
needed to come into entrepreneurship out of necessity for my health. And one of the things was um, everybody's like, oh, well, you're good at writing grants, do that. And again, to all the grant writers that do this full time, props to you. Seriously, round of applause. Yeah. Because it's, just, yeah. it's not <laughs> speaking to my strength, exactly what you were saying. You, you work in your um, zone of um, expertise. Like that's where we need to focus on. And I'm so glad that you took that leap of faith, even though you used that word failure. And I, I you know that we've talked a lot on this podcast about reframing what failure looks like. Um, and when you were saying that so much of your identity and sense of self-worth was wrapped up in this. So I guess before I, I go into kind of where you are today, how did you manage that? I mean, you're at this point where things are just... Um, you know, you were using the, the term dark night of the soul. I, I guess, can you explain that to people who haven't heard that term before? And, you know, while you're in this pit of despair, essentially, you know, how did you, how did you navigate that? Yeah, it was, it was rough. And so the way, what I describe as a dark night of the soul is where it felt like, um, it felt like nothing in my life was working. So I felt very stagnant or like I was actually moving backwards. Um, and more critically is that my sense of a personal identity was in crisis. Like it was really that question of who am I, who am I in the world if I don't have a successful career? I never wanted to be a mother. I really always cared about really having a career that made a difference in the world and being successful because I had pride in that. Um, and I wanted that for myself, not just because of the accolades, because it felt really good. Um, and I also knew I wanted to be married. It, now I am. But at the time, it just was a hopeless disaster of a scenario, too. And so I was single with no prospects. I had invested two years of an Ivy League graduate degree and 10 years of my life in a field. And I felt like, sure, I had hit some, some high points in terms of the employers that I had. And I had you know, great trips and stuff. But I felt like I... I didn't know where else to go. And so it became, um, I just realized that I was kind of in a lull and that really lasted for five years. I did Myers-Briggs tests. I um, did personality tests. I eventually did some personal healing, went to workshops to understand what were my issues in relationships. How do you figure out what you're going to do? I worked with a career coach and I explored working in the fashion industry, opening up a franchise. And I don't remember what the, I looked at three different career ops tracks over the course of six months, did research, did research, talked to people, informational interviews, only to realize I didn't want to do any, any of them. And I was still back at square one. So I kept researching. I kept, you know, asking, praying for guidance. Um, when I moved to New York City, what I did was, since I knew I didn't want to be in the environmental field, is I looked at transferable skills, right? So I did event management, event planning. And so I thought, well, I'll just transfer that skill into another arena. And so in New York City, when I was there, I got a job as kind of a director of events for um, another nonprofit, which was um, religious of but um, and that was another nightmare because they were abusive and and awful. Even though I was working with presidents and really high level people, which really felt great and normal to me. Um, but it was it let, made me sick. Um, I actually got a lot of anxiety and depression and gained more weight, um, only to then really have to crash and dash out of that because it was really I was it was affecting my mental health because they were just 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 not treating me well. And so then I did another services uh, transfer skills transfer, which was I knew a bad idea was I said, well, maybe it'll be fast and easy for me to just to get a position as an executive assistant, knowing that a, that was a blow to my ego, although bless all the assistants in the world, because that's such a tough job, but I'm not detail oriented in that way. And I don't like to take orders from people in that way. It's just, I like to be the one giving the orders. Um, and so I found a job at a Portuguese investment bank and got the position because I spoke the language and, you know, between my resume, I made my resume look good. I transferred the resume to make it look appealing and they hired me. 
then they fired me nine months later in a very embarrassing way. I was told that I was their worst executive assistant in 20 years, which I think was not fair. Um, and then I got a position through a recruiter at Barclays Bank in New York City, also doing events. But they have a whole other intense way of doing events that I wasn't familiar with. And they wanted me because I knew Brazil and knew Portuguese. And before my 90 days uh, trial was up, I was uh, fired um, from the conference room. I had to couldn't go back to my desk. So at this point, I'd gone through five years of trying to find my way, being fired twice from two jobs in the course of a year, miserably and in a humiliating way. And I was at that point, this was 2010, at rock bottom. Um, and so I was able, to, living from home, to take a year sabbatical and say, okay, I don't know where I'm going. I just need a break because I am tanked, like done. And then I got a postcard for Tony Robbins uh, event in New Jersey, UPW, and I did the four-day course. I had some money that allowed me to do his entire year of trainings. And and then I found out about nutrition school um, and I thought, well, this is a way for me to heal my emotional eating stuff. And turns out you could also get a coaching degree from that. And so I did the year long uh, court, uh, training and then um, decided to be a health coach. <laughs> Here we go again, entrepreneurial. And then um, but really knowing that I wasn't meant to be a health coach, but you know, I knew that from personality tests and my life experience that people always came to me to show their problems. They trusted my guidance. They always called me a wise soul. And so I went from there and um, I became a health coach for three years, knowing that it was a stepping stone to something else. I would help people with, people would hire me to help them with emotional eating only for me to really work on their careers because, you know, misalignments in the work they were doing was resulting in, in them overeating. And then I came upon, and this was 2012, I think, the or 2013, the Akashic Records, which is a way to connect to your soul. Uh, it's an ability we all have and to channel guidance from our guides. And I did healing work. Uh, I hired someone to help me with some old uh, stuff I had to deal with and uh, realized that this whole Akashic Records thing was amazing. You could do amazing healing. And I was like, I want to learn that. That is the missing piece to the work I'm meant to do. I got trained in the in in how to read, connect to my own guides and then to connect to the guides of others. Did a hundred free readings in two months because I was like, I need practice. This is a lot of responsibility and did everything like from why did my boyfriend leave me to what is my life purpose to who killed my father? I mean, li literally all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, do I move to New Zealand? And then I found that I hated the relationship stuff. I don't have any medical intuitive ability. Couldn't care less, you know, whether you marry someone or not, but I had a real knack for helping people with their businesses. And so I rebranded my entire business from health coaching to doing intuitive business. And using the Akashic Records as a tool to help people find their path in business to make the world a better place. And so it's been definitely a journey that, I mean, I could, I didn't even know all these things existed, you know, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even plan it. And then as I was starting to channel stuff for people in their businesses, my own guides asked me to channel this little book, little fuckers they were, because I was like, oh, that's 20, 30 pages, that'll be fun. Well, 165 pages later, an entire body of work later, which is now the Soul Fluent Leadership Archetype, um, I now help people understand who they are at a soul level, what their unique, you know, your, their uniqueness is, right? And to help them leverage it through an archetypal based framework, uh, which are the Soul Fluent Leadership Archetypes. There are five. Um, and so, and help business owners in particular more established business owners um, that are have businesses that support the greater good understand what makes them truly tick um, as a leader and then to show up fully expressed um, in their business through the lens of their archetype. So I'll stop there. <laughs> That brings us up, up to date to today. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you're like, you're like, what else is she going to say? <laughs> no, 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 no. Because th this is, 
I, I feel like when you're talking, I'm like, oh, I'm talking to a kindred spirit. Like I really, really am. <laughs> so I'm, I, 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 and this is how, this is how I think. This is how I like, I absolutely, I, I get it. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Okay. So I'm trying to, <laughs> let me try to focus back on um, the things I really wanted to highlight that you had said about um, the transferable skills. And I think that people so often want to have it all figured out before they jump in. And like, there's this perfectionist mindset and it's, um, it, it's, <laughs> that's backwards thinking. You can't, you can't do that because you're not going to have that clarity until you have the action. And even though you were like, you know what, this is, this is a bad idea for me to be an executive assistant, or this is a bad idea for me to go and take this event planning job. Like there's, you know, it was, that ability to pivot. Um, you just had that, as you were saying, the stepping stone to something else. It's just that next step to the that next level of clarity and that next step and that next step. So th- th- this is just fantastic. I, I want to um, make sure that everyone understands what soulful leadership is. So can you talk about that and then the importance of the archetypes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we all have uh, within us innate talents and an innate way of adding value and contributing to the world. Leadership is defined in my work as contribution. And I like to think of contribution as adding value. So we're all adding value for all leaders. But we all have lots of preconceived, antiquated notions of what leaders are like should be what we need to have or sound like or experience to lead. And that's really not the reality of what's possible for us when we embrace that we do have value. We are making a difference. And the question is, do you know yourself well enough? Do you know what you naturally do really well and how you're designed to lead so you can actually come Come lead from a place of confidence um, and strength instead of going, oh, but I'm not this, you know, I'm not good enough at that. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have a college degree or I don't have all these accolades. I haven't been on TV. I haven't written books. It doesn't matter. Once you know yourself well and you embrace what you do well, then you can show up and actually speak up, be more visible, write the book, do the talk, make that pivot, you know, ask for the promotion and so on, or start your own business or whatever. So, so fluent means being fluent in your soul's language of leadership, which is your archetype. Archetypes have been around for a long time, and it's just different ways for us to access energies that are in our as a collective unconscious. And we all have it's part of human nature, right? And so pretty much understanding your archetype means that you're working with yourself versus against yourself, right? Because so many of us feel like, oh, you know, to do this or to, to succeed, I've got to be X. And you're like, I hate it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, there is a better way. What if you love it and you embrace what you do well, you get paid for it well, and you make the kind of change and impact that you want to make, Right. And so the archetypes are an invitation to be yourself without boxing yourself in, pigeonholing yourself into something you hate or doing stuff that you really are not meant to be doing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I had um, taken your quiz. And so I was looking at your archetypes first and I <laughs> I was like, I want to be the divine feminine. That just sounds pretty. And I was the mystic. And so when I started, yeah. look, I started reading and I was like, oh yeah, that's me. Cause it's talking about like, um, being intense. I have been called intense and cutthroat so many times. <laughs> and then just looking at like the challenges of this archetype and one of them being, um, you know, that you become isolated and a loner and, you know, and I can actually, you know, I, so I joke that I, I just, I don't like people in my space and I like joke about it, but I can actually have this conversation with you. Cause I know that you're going to understand me. Like, it's just, it can be really sensory overload. Like just going to the grocery store I mean, you've got these bright lights, you've got all the smells of the food, all the noises and all the people. And there's like all these, just like, you're feeling the frustration of everybody and you're feeling everybody's anger. I'm like, I gotta just do this. And ah, why are there so many people? And, you know, And it's just super, super overwhelming. And when you're talking about leadership, often looking a certain way, when you're someone who's 
I mean, I, I think the term's highly sensitive. Um, it's how are you going to navigate that? Because you, you see these leaders and this is how they're doing it. And you even um, try to emulate that. And then it just throws you into a spiral that it's even it's even worse off for you because you're not in alignment with who you truly are. And that's that's what you're doing with these archetypes. Yes. I, and it's a simple phrase I say, when you know yourself better, you lead better, right? And so for me, going through this work, because I was like, I don't want a body of work on leadership. I don't understand this. I don't want it. And then there's a whole soul component to this. I'm like, people are going to laugh me out of the room. This is going to be a disaster, right? This is 2016 when I think now, you know, the world has changed, hopefully, uh, for the better. And um, it's really challenging. But the, um, it is an invitation for us to align with our natural talents. I truly believe that um, when we show up in the full expression of our talents and we really embrace the genius, the magic, and the brilliance of how we are designed at a soul level, that we will really make the world a better place and be happier people for it. And we get to define consciously what contribution we're going to make. It's not about size. It's, not a, it's really about intention and discernment. You know, and um, and then we get to define what leadership means to us. And that is part of the growing up, the evolution process. There's an ascension journey in my book, which we'll talk about, which kind of takes you like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to lead. Can I do it? OK, I'm leading. And then you kind of go through this metamorphosis. And then you come out and like, yeah, I know who I am as a leader. And I know what leadership is going to look like and mean for me. But that means unhooking from deprogramming, un unwiring from all that programming that we've been told or shown about what leadership should look like or sound like. And just like you said, we've seen so many terrible, terrible examples of leadership that even if we wanted to be a leader, we're like, I'm not gonna because I don't want to look or sound like a jackass or an asshole like those people, right. you know? Right. But um, so really stepping up for ourselves to define what what values we want to express and embody as leaders really can make a difference because that can guide you and saying, yeah, I want to be have integrity. I want to be transparent. I want to be genuine. Um, and to then say, OK, you know, as mystics, I'm also mystic. You know, we use our intuitive, creative and healing abilities to elevate consciousness and to create greater harmony in the world. And so that means that we're amazing space holders, that our energy alone creates healing. Hallelujah. That means we don't have to stuff ourselves with extra content. We don't have to overprove. We just know that our presence make a difference. For me, Tiffany, that was a game changer right there, you know? So yay. <laughs> To your point about the poor examples of leadership, there's also this notion of, oh, I don't want money because I don't want to be evil. I don't want to have the corruption that happens when you get money or there's this perception of it. So it's not only reframing leadership, but it's also reframing money. I mean, money is just a tool. And, and that's how you're also able to, I mean, of course, as you were saying, like success is very, very different um, to each person. It's it's about, um, you know, the intention and discernment, but it's, you know, you're able to make such a greater impact. So not to be afraid of money or gaining money or limiting yourself to what you think you should have because of this fear of, I don't want to become this evil person, or I don't want to become, you know, what I'm seeing um, as people in leadership who have money what becomes of them. That is a good point. Yeah, I completely understand. And yeah, it definitely happens. So I want to go back to the Akashic Records because I've, I've heard of this before. And I mean, I have a general idea and you talked about it, but can you just explain it a little bit more? So I, there's supposed to be this ethereal book that is, um, this is my understanding. This is why I need to go. And for everybody else who doesn't understand what this term is. So there, it's supposed to have everything written down. It, it, please, please correct me on all the places that I'm wrong, which I'm sure is all of it. So can you clarify what the Akashic Records are? 
Yeah, the Akashic Records are sometimes called the Book of Life. It's been mentioned in the Bible. It's been it's been around for forever. And pretty much the notion, my friends like to describe it as the Google database of the soul, of our soul uh, in the ether. So it's pretty much, people describe it as a library, or you can think of a database that contains everything about every soul um, through the beginning of time. And the way to access this knowledge and this insight and this healing in this very high frequency, ethereal place of love and truth is to usually you say a prayer and there are books on this that teach you how to do it. And then you gain access to this frequency of love and truth where you connect to your your soul guides. They're called the record keepers, the keepers of your soul's records in the ether. And you can connect with them at any point in time and ask for guidance and support and clarity and healing. It's not meant to be a place of prediction, but rather a place of personal empowerment and sovereignty um, and a place for you to come to ask guidance from your soul and from your soul guides on how to truly live a purpose-driven um, good life uh, for yourself. And so it's really, you know, some people access the records without even knowing it. But usually it's just done through the act through um, by creating a prayer um, and then and then through intention. Um, and so anyone has the ability to access the records. And I find that those that come to it have feel a pull or a calling to it. Um, and um, and then, you know, you can stay there and just connect to your own guides. Or some people like to learn how to connect to the guides of others, the other records of others. And then to do readings for them and to support them. Or in my case, I do, you know, obviously it's part of my packages is to help people uh, with the readings. That's what people really come to me for, the soul piece. But I also, I'm able to, you know, channel people's marketing plans and write books and channel dense bodies of work, you know. I just sit at the computer, I open the records, and I start typing. Um, and so it's, um, it's just my ability. You know, some people you know, focus on different aspects of talent that they might have or preference in terms of working in the Akashic uh, Records. It's just really a great way to connect to your soul. And it's a profound and deep place of insight and wisdom and clarity, healing and support. Thank you. Um, because I, I was, I mean, I've heard of it before, but it was just always very vague. So it was, I, I was always very fuzzy on it. So I'm in, it was a very vague term. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, but I know you mentioned that you have a book launching soon, actually on the 25th. And this um, episode is live on the 24th of February. So a day before, that's fantastic. <laughs> Perfect synchronicity. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what um, the book is about and what actually called you to write it? I mean, other than your guides telling you, this is what you have to do. Uh, well, it's the yes, yeah, so it's the Soul Fluent Leadership Business Guide. Amplify your message, visibility, and profits by leveraging your archetype. I know that's a mouthful. So there are five Soul Fluent Leadership archetypes. There's the mystic, the visionary, the strategist, the explorer, and the divine feminine. And they each have a dominant motivation to lead, innate talent, their innate kryptonite. And um, the book shows you um, through six core business areas how to apply your soul fluent leadership archetype to grow your business and to elevate and evolve in your own personal leader, leadership as a, as a leader. And so we look at branding, manifesting, business model, team building, um, uh, visibility and money mindset, and I'm missing one now, marketing. Uh, and so we look at all these six categories for each of the five archetypes and their examples of this is how you would apply your messaging. There are 15 diverse businesses that are showcased in there to see how different businesses, you know, show up in this particular archetype. So there's five archetypes and three ex business examples for each. And then there's also the bigger concepts of fluent leadership, which is to create win-wins in the world, right? Where you win and I win, create a world where everyone thrives, not just a few. And really to step into a model of leadership that is inclusive, more uh, open, expressive, uh, in flow, nourishing. And that's really more about the we, not just the me. 
And it all, it's really about how to do business through the lens of your soul and more specifically through the lens of your archetype. It's practical, it's inspiring, and it really is a 222-page, all-color, 8.5 by 11 reference guide to how your soul is designed to grow and lead in business. That's awesome. And I, I love how it's um, talking about the inclusive leadership and the win-win in the world because it's looking at the poor examples of leadership and then reframing it so that people understand that that does not have to be what leadership is. And that's how we uplift the planet is by each of us following our own soul's path, doing what we are meant here to do and working that through our archetypes. I agree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you wrote the book. <laughs> um, so what advice would you give someone starting out in the entrepreneurial world, um, especially when coming from the nonprofit space? And it sounds like it's um, to really just leverage your your archetypes and, and follow what that soul guidance is. But um, is there anything else that I'm missing from things that you've you've done in your own life and that you're really working with your clients on doing? Yeah, I think that um, in my case, looking back to answer your question for someone really making the transition, I would look at in one on one aspect, what do you feel you're innately good at that you already know? And then see if just because you're good at it, does it mean that you still want to be doing it? Or do you want, do you see that you can apply it to a different field? Like if you're really good at writing and you wrote grants, but you really, that's kind of, you're over it. Do you still <laughs> want to do writing if you're good at it? And in what capacity? Right. And then the second question I would ask is, what are you craving? In my case, I was craving more beauty. I was creating sparkly, craving sparkly things and colorful things. And I was craving creativity and um, more independence. Um, and so just and I was like, OK, and then what am I interested in? And then see whether it be through my books, through the archetypes or strength finders or other ways of just seeing. Well, and then I also ask people, what do you what do you see in, about me? You know, what are my talents? What do you see me doing? Um, and then it can be a combination of doing a bit of research, you know, and then giving yourself space, as you said, to think outside the box, you know, because, you know, if you think about counseling or coaching, it's like, what, am I going to be a therapist? No, I don't want to see eight patients a day and, you know, be stuck in an office. Like, so stay open to the configuration and give it, give it some breathing room before you pigeonhole yourself into this or that's the salary. And then look at how much money you make and the kind of experience and career or business that you want to have. You know, do you want to be in a brick and mortar? Like I always knew I wanted to be virtual so I could have location independence. So just some things to consider as you're going about it and to have patience and compassion with yourself as you take this courageous step. That's fantastic. Priscilla, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your wisdom, all of the information for how to purchase your book and everything will be in the show notes. Thank you so much. And um, if people want to start, um, they can also go and take the free quiz, right? PriscillaStefan.com forward slash quiz. It's three minutes. It's free. You'll identify your archetype and get some goodies along the way to help you remember how awesome you are. Absolutely. That will also be in there. If, you, if that was too fast for you, that will also be in the show notes. Thank you so much, Priscilla. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.